just like that. Hey everybody, it's Old School Heart back with another review for you guys. So first things first, if you are not a subscriber to this channel, please hit the subscribe button down below. That way you're able to get updates on different reviews that I'm doing. Please also like this video. Please share this on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter or wherever you can share videos at. That'd be great. Also, please comment down below. Please let me know some of your experiences in the judicial system. Please let me know whether or not you are liking the documentary on Spike TV. Please give me feedback on other uh, reviews that you would like me to do. Uh, critique the uh, reviews that I've already done. That'd be great. But let's uh, discuss some of the issues in our community. Let's discuss some solutions and let us talk about our experiences. I would love for this to be that type of community. So please, please, please leave your comments below. I most definitely read them and respond to them. So this uh, review is going to be on Khalif Browder's documentary, episode three. Uh, if you have not gotten a chance to already, episode two and one are already uploaded and you can take a look at those as well. Uh, so um, episode three, uh, I like to call solitary confinement. And I told you guys in episode two that I thought that three would be on solitary confinement. Now, I did work in the prison jail system. And so um, please forgive me if I do not call solitary confinement, solitary confinement. My detainees, my in Inmates call solitary confinement seg. Um, they refer to it as seg time. And so that's what I will probably call it. Seg is just segregation. Um, now, I did say that I did work in the jail prison system. And so um, I had inmates, uh, detainees that were assigned to me that were in segregation, male and female. And so I definitely uh, know... Uh, about that experience. And so uh, when I'm talking to you today, uh, please note that I definitely know what I'm talking about when I talk about segregation. Um, and so Khalif Browder is in segregation actually for 247 days of his 404 days at Rikers Island. Um, now, uh, I think I sort of explained in episode two how segregation works. So you get put in segregation for certain offenses that occur in jail that you commit. So um, those um, offenses can be fighting like Khalif Browder did. Khalif Browder was pretty much put in seg time for fighting, even though it really was self-defense. Um, they considered it um, an offense, and he was um, given seg time. Uh, seg time can be for stealing. Like I had two inmates that were a part of another part of the jail that I took care of, and they were put in segregation because when it was time for commissary, they stole like some chips behind the um, commissary workers' back, and the officer saw it and. Their story was the commissary worker liked them and said she was going to turn her back and then she turned her back and then they stole. Uh, but they were caught and they were put in segregation. Uh, you can get put in segregation for harassing uh, someone like me who was a social worker or, you know, uh, like I told you before, or I don't know if I did tell you this before, but um, as a female, you know, sometimes I would get flashed by males. They would show me their penises. They would masturbate in front of me. You would get segregation time for that. So any offense um, that, you know, you would get in trouble for on the outside world is what you can get in trouble for um, in jail, except for, you know, fights clearly, you know, if nobody sees it, nobody's in trouble. Uh, so Khalif Browder, it, Browder is in um, segregation time on two different instances for fighting. The first time, I think he was in there for, hmm, 300 days for fighting. And then, um, no, I don't, I'm sorry. I do not have that information. I know that he did 300. Okay. So he did 300 days, um, in segregation at one point. Um, 
I think that's what the documentary said. 404 days in Rikers and 247 in SEG. But um, they said he had did 300 at first. So I'm a little confused. I will get that number to you in the next video. But um, that's what I have. Um, so he, uh, during his segregation time, it talks about how he was mistreated by different officers. Um, he refers to one officer, Mr. Hurt that would not give him water, uh, that wouldn't give him his food tray. And so he went um, days without eating. Um, his family noticed his weight just declining, declining, declining. Um, and so, you know, they were most definitely worried about him. But um, during his de deposition, he talks about Officer Hurt and just how badly he was treated um, in segregation time. Um, he complained to them that, you know, he was beginning to hear voices and see different things, but they did not want to listen to him. Um, now, usually in SAG time, especially where I was at, anytime an inmate says, I hear something or I want to talk to a psych, psych worker is supposed to come and talk to them, even if they come to find out that that inmate just wants attention or just wants somebody to talk to they still have to talk to that person because suicidal ideations can happen in segregation because they are secluded. And so it's important that you allow them to have um, a therapist, a social worker, or somebody come and talk to them and vent at that point in time. Uh, because you could end up in a situation where uh, Khalif, um, it was said in this part of the documentary that Khalif uh, this was one of the times that he committed, wanted to commit suicide because of all the suicidal ideations that he was having, all the voices that he was hearing. And so, um, yeah, it's important that if they say that, especially where I was at, then we brought a mental health worker in to um, talk to them and try to uh, calm them and try to listen to what it is that they're experiencing. Uh, so Officer Hurts and other officers refused to get him the treatment that he needed, um, the care that he needed. So not only was he going without food and water while he was in segregation, but he was not given a uh, mental treatment like he should have been. Uh, so they did talk about that one. Um, and then they talked about which was... Um, which I had never heard this story before. We hear about Sandra Bland so much now that um, we don't realize that there were millions of Sandra Blands and millions of people who uh, suffered uh, while in custody, um, while in uh, prison custody. And one of those guys was Jerome Murdoch. Um, they said now he was arrested for living in an abandoned building and he had only been there a couple of days and the uh, cell that he was locked in was extremely hot. And um, he asked, you know, he told the officers, it's really, really hot in here. I need to get out of here. And they did not let him out. And he died uh, because of heat exhaustion. Um, and what's so crazy about his story is they didn't even let his mom know or contact his mom. I guess they didn't have any information on him. And uh, she didn't find out until a month later. And um, so that's, um, I know, like I said before, we hear a lot about Sandra Bland, but there are millions of Sandra Blands and there are millions of men and women who were mistreated uh, because officers do not want to pay attention and do not listen and end up um, being killed in the system. Um and so that's what Khalif was uh, going through. Um, so what I loved about episode three and what I'm starting to love about every episode is that we find out new information about Khalif and his family. You know, their story just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So we found out in episode one that Khalif Browder was adopted uh, because his mom was on drugs. And so Khalif's brothers and uh, siblings were already with Mrs. Browder. And so the next step was regardless of whatever was going on with Khalif's mom, Khalif was automatically given to Miss Broder. So we find that out in episode one. Episode two, what did we find out that was a surprise to me about that family? Oh, let's see. 
I can't think of anything for episode two. I'm so sorry. But uh, episode three, what was so um, shocking to me is hearing about Akeem Broder. And Akeem Broder was Khalif Broder's older brother. Um, and uh, this, we, I think in, for me in episode three, what I found to be fascinating was, you know, why Khalif Ryder has so much tenacity and has so much, um, conviction, conviction in his heart to not take a plea deal, to not say that he was guilty at all, uh, any of that, you know, um, why he was so earnest about that. We, we, we finally figured that out, like why he just was not going on the sentence. And, uh, one of the reasons is because of his brother, Akeem Broder. Uh, Akeem tells us a story about him, um, walking with this young lady, um, when he was 15, I believe 15, yeah, 15, uh, him and that young lady pretty much just clashed or whatever. And, you know, they, you know, like kids are, they go walking around and hormones are high. And basically him and this young lady um, perform, you know, oral sex. She performs oral sex on him. They're caught. And because he's a scared 15 year old, he runs. Um, and while he's taking Khalif Broder and another sibling home, he picks them up because they're younger. He's walking them home. To, two police officers come up to the steps and grab him and put him um, in the police car. And they take him down to the same station. Khalif Broder was questioned at about a book bag. Um, and so um, he... Uh, was basically accused for being um, the Bronx rapist. And at the time, there was a man going around raping women. Um, this alleged person had raped um, 11 uh, women at the time. And basically, Akeem Broder fit the description. Isn't that something else? He fit the description just like Khalif Browder fit the description Um and still in the book bag. And so um, they uh, deem him as the Bronx rapist. Um, and really, uh, when you see who this person is supposed to be, he is an older man. He is a Latino or a very light complected man. And we find out Kim Broder basically is light skinned, um, kind of can pass for Hispanic. Um, and so basically they say he's got to be that person. So um, what ends up happening to Akeem is they drop all pretty much all the charges and he's given the charge of sodomy. And what's so crazy is his family basically takes a, a second mortgage um, to try this whole case. And what they tried to do was give him a plea bargain of 20 years to confess to this. Now, um, he was 15 at the time. Um, there was no evidence that ever said that he ever raped any girl or anybody. And it was so crazy because they had some of his classmates asking, does he fit the description? And they're like, he would never, ever, ever, ever go that far. And, um, it's just so crazy how like they pinned this on this 15 year old and they let the case extend so long that by the time it, it was ready to go to trial, he was 16 and he was able to be tried as an adult. Um, of course, uh, the Bronx never find any evidence on this, on this at all. And so he ends up doing eight months um, in prison for nothing. He really shouldn't have even been charged. I guess the only thing that they could charge him for was sodomy, um, which him and the girl were about the same age. He really shouldn't have been charged. He probably, probably just should have been told, hey, you know, you probably don't get fellatio outside. That was his only offense, but he's just like any other boy. You know, a lot of people have all done it before. We've all done stupid things before as children. And so, um, basically, Cleve Broder sees this all being unfolded um, and, you know, has this sort of anger and disdain for police officers. And so, like I said, what was surprising to me is to now understand why it was so important for Khalif to not um, take any plea deals and to not say that he was ever guilty. 
Um, and I'm proud of him. And it's just so crazy. I hope he knows. I really hope he knows that I we admire him. I admire him so much. I wish I could just like hug him and just say, man, you are brave. I wish he like he was on the college or um, lecture circuit just so I could hear his story and just so I could just have been able to meet him. Uh, because at such a young age, he wasn't going. And, you know, it's kind of crazy because if I was a part of his family or if I was like his best friend or something like that, I'd be like, Khalid, just take this in so you can just come home. We miss you. You're going through a lot. You've lost weight. I just want you to come home. But Khalid didn't do that. And so I just love that, you know, he stuck to his instances. He stuck to his guts, you know, and he did not, you know, um, he did not um, belt you know, under guilt. He did not break, sorry, under guilt. <clears throat> um, so um, we get to hear that story about Akeem. Um, and Akeem just basically said, you know, because of this, you know, I'm forever a criminal. I'm forever seen as somebody who did something wrong, even though I was a kid and I just made like a stupid decision. And so we get to uh, hear that. Um, we get to hear his story. Um, and then the, the saddest part to me is what um, Mrs. Broder uh, dealt with. Um, we find out that Mrs. Broder was a, a singer, that she went around um, performing uh, different places with a group that she was in. Uh, she did uh, ODs, you know, um, Diana Ross type of uh, songs and things like that. She looked really gorgeous and really pretty, but you could tell the weight of uh, Akeem's case and then uh Khalif's case did a number on her. Uh, you can see that. I don't know if she cut her hair or what, but you can see from the older videos that they showed of her singing, um, her skin was really beautiful and her hair was very full. And then you see the the effects of um, Akeem and Khalif Broder's um, um, jail time just weighed on her mind and her body. And they, she talks about how she had congestive, congestive heart failure, that she did have a heart attack. And so it just was a lot. And it, I just felt for her because, you know, um, going back and forth to jail, the long process of dealing with that, um, not being able to touch your son and just like feel him through the gr the uh, glass, the long route to uh, jail, the having to not be able to take certain things in, even though she was diabetic and she needed to, um, just those types of things were uh, just very taxing on her. And you could see just the weariness and the weariness of all that happened to uh, her during this whole process and what she had to give up. Uh, because of this, you know, putting your house up for a second mortgage just to take care of um, having a lawyer and then also, you know, knocking on the neighbor's door and asking for money to take care of Khalif's um, uh, bail that she couldn't even use. I mean, all of that can be just straight frustrating um, and just a mess. And so, <clears throat> like I said, um, this mostly deals with segregation time and what he had to deal with. Um, segregation is, like I said, it's a mental, um, it, it taxes on your mental stability um, because you're not really able to talk to somebody. Um, like if you're in segregation and say, for instance, you know, you know that there are other people in segregation with you. Um, even if you want to, a lot of times uh, different officers will not allow you to have communication and scream back and forth with um, the person that's like next door to you. So you can't even really have conversation with that person. And so basically scenarios start to play in your mind and they're not going to be nice, fun scenarios. They can be for a little bit where you're imagining things, but if you see no sun um, if you don't see the outside, then your scenarios become dark and your, um, anytime you're in darkness, you know, your mind can just go to some really, really awful things and you can start to hear voices. And so, um, I know for sure that a lot of my detainees dealt with that. Um, I did have a detainee, um, I think I said this in the previous video, he took some urine and 
stored it pretty much in containers um, and feces. And um, he went out to take his shower. And I guess because he had a lot of sex time for, I forgot what he did, but he had a lot of sex time. He had over 30 days to do in sex time. Um, he took the urine and the feces and just threw it everywhere on the cells, on the doors, on the uh, officer's computer, at the desk, the whole nine. Um, <clears throat> and because of that, because I'm just, I can't deal with that. Um, I didn't come in there uh, for a couple of days um, until I knew it was fully clean. Um, so that just gives you an in, just my perspective or um, just a little experience with with what I dealt with when um, I had to dig with se deal with segregation. Now, uh, anytime you have a long segregation, you are allowed one day out, at least where I was, you are allowed one day out to spend back in the community with uh, what we call gen population, general population. And so um, a lot of my girls were in segregation uh, for fighting and uh, different things, and they were given their time out um, and given gen pop time, and then they were they had to come back in there. Um, so I will say that's a change. I don't know if they had that back then, but uh, most definitely now. Um, that is something that um, you don't have to stay in segregation that long, even though I had adults. So it was quite different for Khalif, who was only 16 at the time and was put in jail. So um, that was a little bit, um, that's how, you know, pretty much it works there. But he basically was given all of this time and that's where he, those ideations occurred. And so um, he talks about a time where he was going to commit suicide and um, the officers were just kind of looking at him and just was like, I don't care, just do it. And you see them like looking at him hanging from uh, his cell door. Um, and, um, you know, they're not, they didn't give a crap. And so they put him down and they told him it was going to hurt. And basically they started fighting him. And so Khalif was so smart and you hear him talking during the deposition. He said, the smartest thing that I could think to do was to take the fight and push myself outside so that the cameras were able to see what was going on. And they were fighting me. They were hitting me, you know? And, um, one of the officers was talking about basically how, uh, a former officer at Rikers was talking about basically how, you know, an officer can have 40 inmates at a time, you know, and how hard that is to deal with and how a lot of officers become very irritable and very angry and basically can, you know, give zero fucks. Sorry uh, for using that language, but give zero fucks about what happens to an inmate and to a certain extent, they feel like they have a little bit of power. And so basically they use it, you know, and they are even more destructive and even more harmful to these inmates. And so if you have a, a an officer who has a chip on their shoulder um, and, is that come, and is coming in to work with these inmates, he's gonna treat them like shit. And so basically that's what they were doing with Khalif, you know, and because, you know, they already are in charge of 40 people and there's not enough officers to go around, you know, you know what happens, you know, um, basically these officers are allowed to do whatever they want. And that's what we see in this is that they're irritated. They don't want to be bothered. Khalif is getting on their nerves and they don't see the, the uh, mental illness that is occurring from being in segregation. So basically they see it as you're being a troublemaker. So I'm going to give you trouble. And so basically uh, that's what was happening with Khalif. Uh, they do discuss briefly um, just how long it is going through the judicial process. <coughs> um, it is very long. Like my, I have, I had inmates who um, had been uh, there before I even got there, you know, um, for a couple of years. I had inmates who had been there since 2012 uh, with rape cases. And I had inmates that had been there since 2014 with murder cases. We know murder cases can take a little bit longer, but I had inmates who were there for molestation and rape from 2012. 
Um, and their cases were just continuances after continuances after continuances. And a lot of time, a lot of people don't understand that when you are going through the process, you know, um, that's what a lot of it is. Like you will ser seriously go to court for them to say continuance and then that's it. And you're going right back to your cell. And basically that's what was happening with happening with Khalif. He was basically um, going to court and there being a continuance. And the reason why that there was a continuance is because we find out that um, the, uh, who was it? The witness supposedly left and went to Mexico. Um, and that just, you know, that doesn't make sense. They, number one, um, the police department couldn't find the witness for a long time. And then we find out that this witness allegedly, you know, went to, no, okay, so February 2012, the DA couldn't find the witness on, in 2012. Um, and then we find out that he supposedly went to Mexico. So that's how things could just continue because they're trying to figure out where this person is. So they're giving it a couple of months. So for Khalif, this went on for three years, you know, where he went to, and you were supposed to go to court every month. All of my detainees, at least where I was, they went to court every month. So basically that's what was happening. He was going, they would say continuance. He would go again, they would say continuance. And they were talking about his lawyer. His lawyer's name was um, Brandon O'Mara. And what they were saying about him was, of course, he was court appointed because Khalif didn't have any money because who has that type of money? His parents already put out a second mortgage for Akeem. Clearly, they didn't have money for another attorney. So then you have this court-appointed lawyer who really didn't know or make that much of an effort because he was already in over his head over the other cases that he had. And so he couldn't pay that much attention to Khalif's uh, trial, even though it was really basically easy because they didn't have anything on him. He could have ended this very quickly. And somebody said that there was literally no excuse for this. And to me, literally, there was no excuse for him not to have ended this trial very quickly. Um, but um, a little of that has to do with the fact that, you know, these type of lawyers are in over their head. There's not enough of these um, court appointed lawyers to um, take care of the demand of uh, those uh, men who don't have any money in prison. <clears throat> so I get kind of where he was overwhelmed, but at the same time, pay attention. They even said that he kept sending letters for court back to the parents' house, even though Khalif was in jail. Didn't make any sense. So um, they did discuss that as well. So uh, basically, like I said, this was pretty much about um, seg, seg time. And then once again, the story just keeps tying together on why Khalif was unrelenting and had a reason to be unrelenting, um, um, even though it would have been easier just to come home. So um, this one was very informative. Um, and we get to hear a little bit more about Mrs. Browder um, and a little bit more about um, what was happening in SAG time. Uh, hopefully those officers are in jail. I hope that they realize that, you know, it's um, it was terrible what they did. You know, um, I hope they received some jail time for that. Uh, even I have to go back sometime and just realize, you know, even though... Uh, this type of work is exhausting and frustrating and hard. You know, there were times that I went into the segregation, especially with the men, and I just did not want to go in there because they would be yelling at me. They would be screaming. They would be calling me bitches. They would be masturbating in front of me. And it was really, really hard sometimes. But at the same time, you know, looking at this story about Khalif and reading, um, reading uh, the new Jim Crow and looking at the 13th documentary and slavery by another name, you know, I, I look back on it now and say, sometimes I lack compassion, even though I asked God for it a lot, I still lack compassion with them. And I still was very timid and um, very, very, very um, sometimes 
not aware of what they were going through. Um, so it's just a lot to take in. And I hope that you guys are able to understand and take in all of this. Um, hopefully you'll continue to stay with me through this journey. Um, I will also have the um, update on Dr. Sabi's diet as well. If you're interested in watching that, that'll be uploaded this weekend. Um, let me know how you feel thus far about the documentary since we're halfway through. Let me know um, what's heartbreaking to you and what's confusing to you or what makes you angry about this. If you have any questions for me, please let me know. Um, I am loving the documentary. I am loving that Jay-Z did this. And so I'm excited to see the other three episodes of this. So once again, uh, this is on Spike TV from 9 to 10 and then also on BET from 10 to 11 in my location. Check your local listings. Um, I will be back with the video for this again next Wednesday. And thank you for being patient with me on this video. Um, I'm really, really tired, but I'm so excited that I got this through. Um, yeah, just let me know how you felt about this documentary, um, this episode, um, and any questions that you may have about segregation. This is Old School Heart. Um, see you on my next video. Have a good night.